Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I think we'll start because um, Dr. Levine would like to remind the faculty that there is a meeting of the Faculty of Medicine with the Dean in our sixth floor conference room at 1 o'clock when this is over. Um, I'll finish early, so it's not going to be a problem, uh, which is sort of my gift to you, a short talk. You can see what the title is, and several people have asked me, what in the world does this mean? And I'm going to just briefly introduce it, as this is something that has been of great interest to me for over 30 years that I've studied and taught about. I'm hoping a lot of you already know about it. Um, I'm fairly sure Dr. Davis knows about a lot of these things. I hope many of the rest of you do, but when I was speaking to my team and using some of the vocabulary that I'm going to try to teach you this morning, they looked at me like I was speaking another language, so I may have actually chosen a good topic for this. Here's my disclosure. I ain't got nothing. I have nothing to disclose. I don't have drug stocks. I don't take drug money. I don't even own a pen from a drug company. And we're not going to talk about any drugs or procedures. So I was thinking about advances in medicine. And when I thought about it, I said, we've made a lot of advances in medical technology. We've been able to achieve a whole bunch. And I started thinking about what those things were. And I went way back, and I came up with germ theory. And I'm sure you'll find some more, and you may even differ with my chronology. But I think the, the general idea will get across. Uh, antisepsis is a big technological change for us. Anesthesia, everyone remember the picture in the dome uh, at Harvard where the first general anesthesia was performed. Diagnostic x-rays, huge advance, enabled us to see beyond the skin. Uh, Banting and Best, discovering insulin. Later we were able to synthesize insulin, another disease that we can control. Transplant surgery, CT scanning. I think I skipped antibiotics that was on the bottom of the other one. I just zipped through too fast. Uh, all big advances, MRI, another huge advance. Antibody therapy, all the nibs and mabs and stuff. Genomics, huge advance that will change the way we deal with disease. So we've done pretty well technologically. There's been a fairly regular march of progress. How about advances in modern medical thinking and our thought processes and how we consider the technologies that we have? Well, 400 BC or so, Socrates advised us to know ourselves, and I think he referred to our mind in this case. Uh, 1650, Rene Descartes said, I think, therefore I am, and this is now viewed as the Cartesian mind-body dualism, that the mind is not separate from the body. 1750, Bayes propagated his theorem that truly I, it wasn't until the 1800s that it became used in common science, and it wasn't until literally the 60s to 70s that it was popularized as a tool in medicine. So unless you think a lot of mental change occurred in medicine between 1650 and 1950, there's a big gap there, and we haven't had much. And now we have cognitive psychology and metacognition, which is part of cognitive psychology. In the 1950s, Herbert Simon started looking at what is cognitive psychology, and we'll talk about that. 
Uh, there's been a whole host of people who have contributed to its development. Simon begat, as it were, uh, Tversky and Kahneman, who we're going to talk a lot about. Uh, there's Ariely, Taleb, uh, just a whole host of people who have popularized ideas in cognitive psychology. And so you may ask, why am, I, why am I even talking about it? Because I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. What, what does it mean to us? So let's do a few definitions. Cognitive psychology is the investigation of human mental processes and abilities, which would include perceiving, learning, remembering, thinking, reasoning, and understanding. So it is the study of how people acquire and apply knowledge and information. Well, I think that applies to us because we are constantly applying, acquiring and applying knowledge both in the progress of science and in treating our patients. Now, one could argue that this is how we lead our whole lives. We're supposed to be doing this when we go home as well. But let's just talk about it as it relates to us as practitioners in medicine. I used the word metacognition before, and this refers to getting knowledge about knowledge, about understanding the thinking process and regulating the thinking process. So how can we use the way we think most effectively? Do our thoughts occur randomly, or, or is there some kind of a progression, and can we control it to our benefit? when and how to use particular strategies for learning or problem solving. And that's what we're talking about, how to be more effective at our work in doctoring. I listed a few people before, but the two people that we really want to talk about, because they are essentially the fathers of what I'm going to talk to you about, and I'm sort of going to dedicate this talk to them, are Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman. And these are two researchers who started their work basically in the early 1970s. Uh, Tversky was active publishing until uh, he died in 1996. Kahneman is still alive and still actively teaching and publishing, doing research. They were both uh, worked and were citizens of both Israel and the United States, and they taught many universities, both of them. Just a little couple of interesting facts. There is something called the Tversky Intelligence Test, and this test was proposed by uh, Tversky's co-workers and students, and it the Tversky Intelligent Test is defined as the faster that you realize that Amos Tversky is smarter than you, the smarter you are. He was very well respected. Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in 2002. Tversky was not included because the Nobel Committee does not award its prize to people who have already died, and he died six years before that, unfortunately. Here's the first audience participation question. This is, uh, this is not our board review, but in what field did Daniel Kahneman win the Nobel Prize? Anybody? Anybody? These are good fields here. Nobody wants to even guess? Excellent. Economics. So why am I talking about him this morning? I told you I don't even have a good stock market portfolio. Because behavioral economics is cognitive psychology. They are deeply entwined, and many of the great behavioral economists have been psychologists. There, there really is no difference. It's how people behave and how to help people control they the way they behave, and to help people predict how other people will behave. So, Tversky and Kahneman 
put together their findings, published a lot, and they came up with something that has been named prospect theory, and it is a theory that is involved in behavioral economics. They said a lot of things that are not surprising, that are not new to us, but they had, they, they took these theories and then they went out and they did a bunch of studies to try to prove them. And we'll talk a little bit about what the theories are and then a little bit about some of the way they did these studies. So they said people make decisions based on the potential value of losses and gains rather than the final outcome. So they don't really plan ahead. They do a, something that we do frequently when we do studies and that we choose poor surrogate endpoints. We choose um, what is the cholesterol, not what is the mortality rate from coronary disease. What decision, you know, when I make a decision, I need to choose the decision that gives me the benefit now, not the one that will really get me where I need to go, but the one that will get me immediate gratification. Well, that doesn't always make sense. That's frequently not the right decision. They also said people evaluate losses and gains using tools or processes called heuristics. Uh, team two, does that sound familiar at all from this morning? They said people make cognitive errors. They do not always behave rationally when making decisions. I hope that that one statement is the least surprising thing that I can say today. Okay, we all know that. It applies to us just like to everyone else. And that people see many patterns and make connections that aren't really there, that are not statistically valid, they're just random, and then base decisions on this. And it's probably not a good way to make decisions. So they did a bunch of studies to show that these cognitive errors exist. All of the studies that I'm going to speak about in the next few minutes were done on guinea pigs, otherwise known as graduate students. Okay? And Kahneman and Tversky, being big time college professors, had tons of graduate students. And this assured them of a gang of subjects who had at least moderate intelligence and were interested and would pay attention when they did the studies. And it also assured them that they would be sort of a cross-section of the country they were in. So to start with, they would take two bags of poker chips and they sampled them. One bag, they took out four red and one white chip. There's a ratio of four to one. The second bag, they took out 20 red chips and 10 white chips, okay? Ratio of two to one red. And they asked the students, which bag is more likely to give you the most red chips? Which bag is loaded for red chips? Anyone? The second? OK, well, the first? OK, so we have two different answers. E excellent. Turns out, four to one, you only have a sample of five. Sample size is 30 on the 20 to 10. So statistically, the answer is the second bag. You're more likely because you have a better sample, and they were, and you know, I am expressing this in words, they have numerical proof, which I'm going to spare you and me from going over today. But the answer here is the 20 to 10 is better because the sample size is so much larger. This, uh, this next study really made a lot of headlines. Um, there's a theory that in basketball there are hot hands. The person who, who during that game appears to be scoring best 
the coach should steer the ball to that person for as many throws and f at the basket and free throws as possible. And for some reason, Tversky and Kahneman got interested in this, and they analyzed every shot taken for a year and a half by the entire Philadelphia 76ers team. And they found out that statistically, this was bunk. That the people who have the best long-term shooting averages are the ones who should get the ball the most. You're more likely to score if you've scored long term and you've proven your ability rather than just what happens in one game. So for basketball, there's no such thing as hot hands. They took a bunch of students and they, they split them in two groups. One group was going to the theater and they had a $10 theater ticket. And when they got to the theater, they found the ticket was lost. They asked them, would you buy another ticket? And they said, no, I wouldn't go to the theater that night because that'd be like paying $20 for the theater ticket. And I'm not gonna pay $20, that's excessive. They took another group and gave them a $10 theater ticket and said, when you get to the theater, you find that you've lost $10 out of your wallet. How bad do you feel? And they said, Eh, it's $10. The fact that it was a theater ticket made that $10 more valuable. We'll talk about why that is a little later. But it's the same $10, but there was a valuable $10 and a less valuable $10. It doesn't really make sense, but that's the way the people reacted when asked the questions. Subject, the next two are really bizarre, but very strong studies. Subjects were asked to write down the last two numbers of their social security numbers. They then were asked to estimate the probability of a totally unrelated event, having nothing to do with that number or social security number. The groups that had low social security numbers estimated a lower probability for the same event than people who wrote down a high social security number. Social security number had nothing to do with anything, but it was in their head. One group of students, this one is just comical. One group of students was asked whether Mahatma Gandhi died before or after the age of nine. That doesn't sound too complex. The second group was asked if he died before or after the age of 140. Okay. Then they said, okay, estimate what age he died at. Guess what age he died at. The group that, was, that had the nine implanted in their head guessed that he died at an average of 50. The group that had the number 140 in their head Yes, that he died at age 67, and it was statistically significant. Okay? One can say that makes no sense, or it would make sense that this is just coincidence. But when you do the numbers, it's not coincidence. And as I try to tell my teams all the time, evidence trumps sense. Sense is great, except when evidence proves that your sensible guess was wrong. I used the word heuristic before. Heuristics are very important. A heuristic is a cognitive process used to learn, recall, or understand knowledge. It's a rule of thumb, it's a shortcut in thinking that is frequently but not always correct. We use heuristics constantly, every day. We use them on the ward. We use heuristics when we cross the street. I look this way, I look this way, I didn't see anything coming, it's safe to cross the street. I didn't look up, maybe something's gonna fall out of space at me. The heuristic says I don't have to do that to be safe. But 
you know, when things are falling out of space, maybe the heuristic is wrong. Lack of awareness that you're using a heuristic can result in error and bias. You need to know that you're using a shortcut, and the shortcut is not perfect. The shortcut may seem solid, but you need to know that it's not perfect, especially when you're using it clinically, and we'll discuss some examples. The first one we're going to discuss is maybe the most commonly used heuristic or shortcut called the representativeness heuristic. I hate the name representativeness because it's hard for me to pronounce. A process by which the probability of an event is classified by how closely its essential features resemble the essential features of the parent population. Or, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. It looks like a duck. Okay? That's what this heuristic says. It seems too simple. After you return to Shreveport from your six-month mission trip to Africa, and it's too bad Dr. Scott isn't here, you see a patient with shaking chills, sweats, fever, and myalgias. What test do you want? Yeah. Right, you want a thick smear for malaria. You just ignored the probability of disease like malaria in Shreveport, however. Okay? You're not in Africa anymore. You forgot that the probability of malaria in Shreveport is extremely low. Not zero, but extremely low. I want a urinalysis, a chest x-ray, and a CBC, and I'm not going to get a, a thick smear unless this is someone who's just come back from Africa with me or some other place where malaria is endemic. But what happens here is we ignore the pretest probability, the prevalence. A 35-year-old woman with hypertension, abdominal striae, obesity, excessive facial hair is referred to you for consultation. What test? Dr. Levine, you want a cortisol? Or do you think it's just in our community, there is an excessive number of obese, striated, hairy women <laughs> with hypertension. Now, the odds of it being, you know, we used to say, ever, and this is a, a, a horribly politically incorrect thing to say, so I'm going to say, other people used to say this. Every July, every fat girl gets worked up for Cushing's. We get a new set of interns. Okay, um, you have to deal with the prevalence of a disease, and Cushing's disease is actually a fairly rare disease compared to hypertension, obesity, and maybe a little touch of polycystic ovary to get you some hair. So maybe the first test you should do isn't a cortisol. So you can't ignore the probability of a disease, because just because it looks like it, if you already know that the odds are low, the odds are still low. You can't ignore the pretest probability. Another way to make errors using the representativeness heuristic is using clues that do not accurately predict the disease. All cues, symptoms, signs or cues. Lab tests can be cues. All of them are not created equal. Each clinical cue has its own positive and negative predictive value, and if you're not familiar with them, you'll make cognitive errors. You will not use it correctly. Another error we make is that cues that are identical or even similar cannot be weighted multiple times in order to help you decide whether you've got a specific syndrome. So for instance, if we take chest pain that is pressure-like, squeezing like an elephant on my chest, radiating to the left arm, it's brought on by exertion, relieved by rest, 
and relieved by nitroglycerin. How many separate valid points for angina are here? Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it looks like angina, walks like angina, hurts like angina, but I don't think there are seven because I think that pressure-like, squeezing, like an elephant on my chest, and radiating to the left arm are all just telling you this is angina-like pain. It's not saying there's four different things telling you it's angina. It's one point for angina, not four necessarily. So there are redundancies here, and you can't wait every redundancy as a separate point. They're just telling you the same thing as the other symptom told you. This will lead you into representativeness where it may not exist. Now, I still think that's a fine description of angina, but it's not as fine as it looks on the surface. Another representativeness error, regression to the mean. Hopefully this is one of the first statistical concepts we all learn about are the changes in the course of the disease or the results of the test a random variation or the result of the treatment you've instituted, instituted or just a result of the progress of the disease that would have happened if you weren't even there? It's what I like to call the because of or in spite of question. Did the change happen because it was just a regression to the mean? or was it because of what you did for it? So, a patient has a mild elevation of serum glucose on a single measurement, which returns to a normal level when retested after three months on a diabetic diet. Can you tell me that this is the diet? Or is it regression to the mean? Because each test has a certain area of variability and we know that unless it's high enough randomness can be involved so you don't want to say this patient has diabetes unless they meet the actual requirements for diabetes you can't just take a sugar and say that's it a, sure, a random sugar of 120 not to argue with the ADA here but if we were to just mentally play the game of taking one random sugar of 120, the next random sugar on that patient is just as likely to be 98 as 150. Sample size. We spoke about sample size when we looked at the poker chips. Okay? So generally, using one's own personal experience as your standard for sample size very, very often will fail to represent the incidence of findings in the population. So as an example, I've used myself, okay? My patient has a heart rate of 110 per minute. He's lost 10 pounds, has tremor, and has been irritable lately. The thyroid is not enlarged. I've seen four hyperthyroid patients in my career all of them had enlarged thyroids. So I estimate the probability of hyperthyroidism as being very low. My sample size says hyperthyroidism has to have an enlarged thyroid. That's a bad sample size. I'll bet Dr. Levine's seen more hyperthyroidism without enlarged thyroids. So sample size counts. To sort of recapitulate what we've said about the correct use of the representativeness heuristic, you have to use it correctly. To use it correctly means to recognize that you're using it, recognize the pitfalls. So you have to ask, what is the prior probability and the prevalence of the disease you're questioning? Without that, you can't use representativeness. Remember, malaria in Shreveport is a very rare disease. How good are the cues? Are they all redundant? Is the patient giving you good cues, good symptoms, good signs? 
Are you just regressing to the mean? Do you have enough of a deviation from the mean that it's not likely to just give you regression at the next test? Is your testing accurate enough? Is there so much noise in the test that 110 is as good as 130 and you can't tell the difference on the same sample of blood? And is my experience or reference group large enough? And obviously the great defense against this is knowledge of the medical literature where the reference group is potentially infinite. This is probably my favorite heuristic, the availability heuristic. And this is defined as the probability of an event is judged by the ease of which the event is remembered. And I have called this the I was burned by fallacy. Where I used to work, we had an emergency room doctor who would do all kinds of what we felt were unnecessary testing. And when you'd go down and ask him, why did you do this? You know, this person has a sore toe. Why did you do a CT angiogram? And you say, I was burned by that once. I once had a patient who had a sore toe and turned out to have a pulmonary embolus. And so he would do a PA gram on everybody. So the availability heuristic says that your thinking will be influenced by rare, vivid, dramatic, and recent things that have happened, and in this case, cases that you have seen. The last patient that I saw with a headache had an amoebic brain abscess. So now, of course, I start all of my headache workups with a contrasted MRI and an LP. Now, I happen to know that most headaches will be classified as tension or migraine in the big course of life. But I saw a brain abscess, so I'm going to test everyone for it, because I don't want to be burnt by that again. Now, I didn't tell you this was the first and only brain abscess I've ever seen, and if statistics, amoebic brain abscess, and if statistics play their course, it is the last one I will ever see. But I'm still not, I'm still falling victim to the availability heuristic and testing everyone for an amoebic brain abscess. Now maybe Dr. Todd's going to tell me we should, but I don't think so. You never know. Anchoring and adjustment heuristic. So physicians make a probability assessment by starting from an initial estimate that we will call the anchor, and then adjusting it to take into account the individual characteristics of the patient or the results of the test. So that makes sense. That's what we do all the time. The problem is that sometimes we set the anchor incorrectly. Like, for instance, the people who were looking at um, Mahatma Gandhi and how long he lived and how did they set their anchor with some random number that we fed them? Or how did people judge uh, once they were told to write down their social security number that's a dumb way to set an anchor, but it's an unconscious or subconscious way that they set their anchor, and those are anchoring errors. If you've already made some errors from the availability or representative heuristics, and then anchor because of that, you're just going to multiply the original error. Not so great. So failure to adjust for the results of tests, which will happen because of either incomplete knowledge about your tests, about the positive and negative predictive values, or the failure to apply Bayes' theorem. So to take your prior probability, apply your test, and come up with your post-test or posterior probability, just gives you error. You have to use your test appropriately, and to use your test, you need to know, you need to have a good anchor, and the anchor will be your pretest probability. Then you have to know the positive and negative predictive values of your test, 
and then you have to apply them. This all leads to unnecessary ordering of tests to confirm things that are already confirmed because you didn't use Bayes' theorem accurately or adequately to get to your post-test probability or leads to incorrect diagnoses because you estimated too high a probability. Framing. The default option has far more influence than an option that you have to either opt in or out, opt out of. And another one of the, the researchers that were influenced by Tversky and Kahneman was Sunstein and his partner Cass. And they looked at organ donors in Europe. And in Europe, as opposed to most states in America, organ donation is automatic when you apply for your driver's license. You're automatically signed up for it, but you can opt out. If you sign here, they won't take your organs. And they went and they looked at places that had opt-in, so it, you don't donate unless you sign for it, in places that you opt out. It's automatic donation unless you sign not to. And if the default is donation, and there's a choice to get out of it, 90% of people with driver's licenses donated their organs. No fight. Places like, oh, the United States, where default is not to donate, but you have to actively agree by signing to donate, there's only a 20% donation rate. Outcome, you know, you're dead, you donate. That's the outcome. It's the same in both cases, but it's how it's framed. If it's framed as this is the way we do it, you can choose not to if you wish, people do it. If it's framed as we don't do it, but you can choose to as an aberrancy if you want, people don't choose that. The oncologists are very familiar with the effect of framing when they present choices to patients. And you may have something to say about this if you like. Um, when life and death choices are presented, if the frame is the odds of surviving, the patients take the safest choice. If the frame is the odds of dying, the patients are willing to take a bigger gamble. The outcome is the same, the numbers are the same, if it's just how you frame it, and there are numerous studies demonstrating this. And usually, this, unfortunately, the studies are not done in people who have the disease or who are dying from the disease. Most of the studies are just done in random populations like graduate students. But you know, the mentation is still there. It's how it's framed that counts. The odds are the same for everything, but it's all in the frame. So what is recommended is that when choices like that, dealing with life and death choices are presented to patients, that rather than use relative odds, we use absolute numbers. This many out of this many do this, period. It is fraught with much less emotional overlay and much less is read into it. The conjunction fallacy. Okay? Linda is a bright, outspoken 31-year-old philosophy major graduate. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and she participated in anti-nuclear weapons demonstrations. Reminds me of a lot of people I knew in college, as a matter of fact. Which is more probable, that Linda is a bank teller or that Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement? Now go and look at the stem and let's see which is more probable. Who votes for choice one? Three, four hands. Choice two? About twice as many. It is assumed in the conjunction fallacy that specific conditions 
are more probable than a single general one. The majority of people chose option two because it seems more representative of Linda. We said she's activist, she's feminist. But if you actually read the question, is it even possible for the two things together to be more probable than one alone being true? It's not possible. Because for choice two to be true, For choice two to be true, choice one already has to be true. So choice one is more likely. So we often don't invoke our, our real knowledge of logic and statistics when answering questions. There are many other cognitive errors that have been identified and named. Some of them are fairly obvious from their name, cherry picking when looking at data, uh, loss aversion, suppressing evidence, which is also sometimes associated with confirmation bias. We only listen to evidence, oh, just like everyone I know, we only listen to things that confirm what we already believe. We like to ignore things that tell us we're mistaken. Countless experiments to show that to be the case, and it's useful to know that we do this so we can guard against it. Uh, belief perseverance, even when something is shown to you, proven untrue, you still believe it. Can't shake a belief. Uh, illusory correlation, other connections are made that just have no connection to the truth. You just get an idea and can't drop the connection. Satisficing is when you stop looking for evidence when you think you've found enough to prove what you want to prove. And so you don't go any further because you might find something that disproves what you want to prove. And probably three or four slides worth more that we're not going to go through. Anyone recognize this saying? House of God, excellent. Okay. So, shortly after I graduated from medical school, Samuel Shem, this is nom de plume, wrote House of God, and in it he had a set of rules to follow, and he said, when you go to a cardiac arrest, the first procedure you should do is to take your own pulse. When you are making medical decisions, the first thing you should do is examine your thinking. Pretty close to what Samuel Shen advised. Are you going to be falling for one of the common, easily recognized cognitive errors? I think we should think of examining ourselves for cognitive error as the clinician's vital sign. We're worried about the patient's vital sign, but we can't make appropriate decisions about the patient's vital signs without knowing our own cognitive vital signs. I was whining to my wife this morning, as always, that it is going to be very difficult to try to teach something in an hour that I am not a world's expert on, that people routinely get PhDs in, and that people get Nobel Prizes for. I hope that you're able to get a taste for what I'm talking about, a taste for the importance of it, why you need to be conscious of it, and to give you some impetus to go out and read more about it so you can be better doctors using this. If any of you are interested in reading lists, there's tons of reading, and I'll take any questions. <laughs>